Welcome back everyone. Today we're getting back into the To Catch a Predator Iceberg created by the Reddit user Wizard Bernie. If you haven't seen it yet, make sure to check out part one, which will be linked below. If you have never heard of the show before, it primarily focuses on adult men meeting a decoy who poses as a minor before being confronted by the show's host, Chris Hansen. And even though the underlying theme of the show is pretty serious, you can't help but chuckle when you see how some of these guys react. That being said, be aware that there is some pretty explicit content ahead head that may or may not be triggering. So without further ado, let's begin the video. Jeff Stacy made a lasting impression on the TCAP fandom with his multiple standout quotes and not to mention his iconic voice. When Jeff met Chris, his voice gradually got higher and higher as the conversation went on. Jeff was 27 years old at the time and was working in a deli shop when he came across a 15 year old decoy named Sadie. Initially, Jeff lied about his age and said that he was 21 instead of 27. And without getting too explicit, immediately after stating his fake age, he asked the girl to swallow his, you know what? Among doing other sexual things. And when I was watching part of Jeff's segment, I came across a comment that said he sounded like Mickey Mouse, Winnie the Pooh, and Marge, and it's so hilariously accurate. Tell you. Yeah. So that's what you did. Mm -hmm. And why were you worried that it might have been a police officer? I ask everybody. Just out of habit? Yeah. Well, doesn't that indicate that you're worried that if it was a police officer, you could get in trouble for what you were doing? No, because I asked that to everybody. To everybody. So you spend your time on the internet at night asking people whether or not they're cops, whether or not they sleep naked, whether or not you can perform yeah. sex acts on them. Mm -hmm. At one point during the questioning, Chris brought up the fact that Jeff sent naked photos to the decoy and Jeff said that they were just funny pictures. And for the entire duration of the conversation, Jeff just has this really nonchalant attitude, seemingly not aware of the situation he is in. He also tried telling Chris several times that real life and the internet are two different things and that everything he said in the chat is just fun and games. Not seeming to realize that he crossed that boundary that separated the internet and stepped into real life. When Chris asked Jeff for his age, he lied at first and said 21, but later said 25, I think. Jeff was later brought to the police to be interrogated, and the guy has a roller coaster of a meltdown. At first, he tried to justify his thinking, saying that everything he was talking about and trying to do were normal things. But once he was told he was being sent to jail, he began to panic and beg the investigators to not send him there. He kept on insisting that he didn't know the girl was 15. And finally, once Jeff realized that the begging wasn't going to work, he started cussing out the cops and declared that he was going to take his own life when he got into jail. Jeff even went as far as to stab himself in the throat to show his resolve, but obviously he was just faking and he barely even left a mark on himself. Then you say to her, would you ride or f me? Do you remember typing that? Yeah. You got any questions for, uh, for us, Jeff? What's going to happen to me? You're going to be taken to Dark County Jail. Please God. You're going to be uh, charged with attempted, uh, attempted unlawful sexual conduct with a minor, okay? It's a felony file. Please don't. I'm sorry. I didn't know. I'm not a child molester. Well, evidently, uh, you were going to molest oh, a child. Because you, uh, everything indicates that. You understand? She said she was 15, and you knew she was 15. You went to the house to solicit sex with a 15-year-old. Did you I know? I did not know. Okay. Right here it is. You had to know. Oh, I don't pay attention. Been, I was going to kill myself. We can work this out, all right? No, I really am just going to slip my f***ing throat. You relax, all right? No, I'm just going to kill myself. Put me in jail and I'll hang myself. I don't care. Ultimately, Jeff was sentenced to six months in jail, and he actually passed away sometime early in 2014 from a drug overdose. And just an additional detail that I found interesting was that Jeff was employed as a child supervisor at a kung fu school. He was exposed at some point and obviously let go. 
Hey everyone, so I want to take a short break to introduce you guys to today's sponsor who I have used myself in the past and have been very pleased with, Skillshare. And stick around to find out how you can get to use Skillshare for absolutely free. Skillshare offers thousands of different ad-free classes that will assist you in expanding your creative or professional horizon. For myself, I want to continue to improve my videos, so I am exploring classes on After Effects and creative writing. Additionally, I have a passion for finance, so I'm also diving into classes that will teach me how to diversify my income and even earn passive income. As I said earlier, I actually used Skillshare in the past to learn many of the editing skills that I frequently use in the videos that you all watch today. There is no goal too small or too big when it comes to Skillshare. If you want to explore a possible new career path, jump into the abundance of coding resources that Skillshare provides. Or perhaps you want to finally learn how to play that guitar you bought last year that's just been collecting dust the whole time. For a limited time, you can be one of the many members to explore the vast discography that Skillshare offers. I have partnered with them to provide the first 1,000 of my subscribers who click my link with a free one month trial of Skillshare. No strings attached. Just visit the first link in the description or in the pinned comment to explore your creative side today. Again, this is only limited to the first 1,000 of my subs, so act fast. Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring the video. Donald Morrison was born on August 11, 1957 in Butler, Pennsylvania, and he was 48 years old when he decided that he'd meet up with a 15-year-old decoy who he had met online. There are several characteristics that viewers may remember Donald by, but it seems that the three that stick out the most are his filthy sweat-slash-grease-stained shirt, the fact that he lives with his parents, and his strange openness when it comes to discussing his past offenses. And his appearance on TCAP was not his first encounter with a minor. This guy was actually arrested in Texas for sending nudes to another minor who was in Michigan. But that particular incident was reduced to a class A misdemeanor and he served a year in jail and wasn't required to register on any lists. So Donald worked as a baker with his parents and promptly after crossing paths with the decoy online, he inquired about meeting in person. Donald made several remarks regarding the decoy's legs and the rest of her body before the decoy mentioned that he seemed like a serial killer. To this, Donald asked if the decoy was a police officer. He also revealed that he had ED, so all he could do was use his mouth. Once Donald arrived at the Sting House, he was offered a cookie and then quickly introduced to Chris, who also offered Donald milk, to which he gladly accepted. In the conversation, Donald stated that he has a crazed obsession with minors, specifically girls, and had met over a dozen of them online. He even brought up that earlier mentioned event where he got arrested in Texas. Furthermore, he told Chris that a while back, he was also arrested for the possession of CP, but for reasons unclear, those charges were dropped. Morrison was, was one of those characters who, had it not been for the graphic nature of his online conversation with someone he thought was a young teenage girl, it would be comical. What's going on? I don't know. I just was talking to her and she said, come down and visit her. I have a compulsion just to, with her younger women, just meeting them. I haven't, I've met about a dozen of them online. Did you ever get in trouble for it? Well, I got in trouble because I met a girl in Michigan. And how old was that girl? 17. And what trouble did you get in there? Well, her grandfather tried to, wanted me to try to charge me with something they couldn't do anything. So they arrested me for trying to, to for possessing child pornography because I had new pictures of her on my computer. They ended up dropping the charges. Donald was adamant that this decoy had invited him over willingly and that he was sort of in a way the victim. He also said that he wouldn't have done anything if it wasn't consensual, which even still is obviously really fucking bad. When Chris questioned Donald on whether or not he would tell his parents about the situation, he said that his mother would take away his computer and throw it away if she had found out. Ultimately, when Donald left the home, he was tackled to the ground and arrested. After the arrest, Donald actually went into diabetic shock and was thus transferred to a hospital before returning to jail. After his trial, he was sentenced to 9 months in jail and 3 years of probation. A while later, Donald actually made a YouTube channel where he referred to his viewers as his sex slaves. Oftentimes, he was found ranting about how he shouldn't be judged or harassed for his actions and that meeting these kids was just an instinctual action that he couldn't control. In 2012, Donald was arrested yet again. This time, it was because he was looking at 
at pictures of minors in a public library when an employee saw him. His excuse was that he was helping a woman in prison get pictures of her nine-month-old child. Then in October of 2022, Donald actually died at the age of 65, and in his obituary, it was mentioned that there would be no funeral. In 2006, 25-year-old Nick Kokos began chatting with a girl named Beth who he thought was 12 years old. Nick started out asking about the girl's favorite movies, foods, or hobbies, but this quickly spiraled downward when Nick asked whether or not the girl was a virgin. Many viewers of the show remember Nick for his Donald Duck shirt that he wore when he visited the Sting House, as well as his butchered hairline. And when asked what his name and age were, he lied. He said his name was Chris and that he was 18 years old. Later on though, he would admit to lying. Additionally, he said that the girl he was talking to was 17 instead of 12. Similar to most of the other suspects on the show, Nick came across as very arrogant and was adamant that he wasn't going to do anything with the girl. But once Chris showed Nick the chat logs, he realized that lying wasn't going to work and he began to play the victim. And probably the worst part of the entire conversation was at the very end when Chris Hansen asked if Nick had any final words before he left. Nick said, don't try meeting people online because they may not be who you think they are. Which is baffling that that was the message Nick took from this. Not that you shouldn't message minors, but that adults need to be more careful that they don't fall into a trap on the internet. Nick's bail was paid and he was ultimately released, but later in that same year, he was arrested again when his illegal credit card business was raided. Authorities discovered a submachine gun amongst other items in his possession. Then in 2008, he was caught once again for trying to get with a minor, this time a 14-year-old. 
Later on in his life, Nick actually changed his name to Ryan Davis, and apparently he found work as an adult film star or something. As the entry says, David Kay was a rabbi. David was born on October 25th, 1950, and he served as a rabbi for over a decade in Maryland and has worked with hundreds upon hundreds of Jewish students, which gave him quite a bit of influence within his community. David was 54 years old when he messaged who he presumed to be a 13-year-old boy named Conrad. Conrad shared with David that his mother had recently passed away, leaving him home all alone on most days. The rabbi saw this as an opportunity to strike and he escalated the situation so fast. David said that he was prowling for young men and then sent over explicit photos of himself sleeping with other dudes. Eventually, the decoy and David agreed to meet in Virginia, which was going to be about a 30 minute drive from where David was living. When we see David step into the sting house, he is just emanating this arrogant energy, but as soon as Chris greets him, you can see his soul leave his body. David just becomes like a deer staring into headlights and freezes for a little while before Chris asks twice for David to sit down, to which he does and says, this isn't good. When Chris asked David if he has ever done this sort of thing before, David paused a bit, insinuating that he may have taken advantage of that power he held in his community as a rabbi. David persistently asks Chris who he is and what he's doing, and when Chris finally tells him, David immediately rushes out of his chair to try and block out the cameras. He started saying stuff like, stop this, you have no right. So how can I help you? Go ahead, have a seat. I suggest you sit down and take your hands out of your pockets, please. Yeah, this isn't good. Not good? I think that's kind of an understatement, isn't it? Yeah. Um, can I know who you are, please? I want to know a little bit more about why you were here first. Huh? It appears from this that you were setting up a meeting with a 13-year-old boy. Okay, you're only 13. Yep, 13. For a 13-year-old, you handle yourself pretty well. Yes, you are very cute, and when boys are that cute, they usually look like their moms. I like sucking and being sucked. Now, presumably, you counsel families and children in your position as a rabbi. Sure. Children. What are you doing as a, a man of God, as a rabbi, in this house, Trying to meet a 13 year old boy. I, I'm really. I, I, I don't want to do anything that's going to further make you angry. I'm not angry. But you're coming across in a very angry and authoritative sense. You know I'm in trouble, and I know I'm in trouble. I'm Chris Hansen with Dateline NBC, and we're doing a story on computer predators. Oh, no. Come on, guys. You don't, don't, you don't want to touch anybody. You don't want it. You've got to stop this. Sit down. Sit down. You don't have any you're right. Free to, you're free to leave any time. We got phone calls from him for months. Obviously, David was furious at this point, but unlike most of these cases, David actually called Chris nonstop, verbally abusing him and demanding for the footage of him to be erased. And after this argument, David just left the house without any further altercations. And the reason why this was possible was because at this point in the show, there actually were no police investigating the cases, and so there were none on site. Later on, we learned that when David returned home that night, he tried to erase his computer's hard drive and then contacted his lawyer to organize a case against Chris. This, however, didn't get very far. The chat logs and information around the incident were given to police, but nothing happened. But as word spread about David, the FBI eventually got involved and a U.S. attorney decided to pursue David based on the information that the FBI provided. David's trial was held in August of 2006, where David tried to get the judge's sympathy. David said that he had struggled with his sexual identity for decades and that his 30-year marriage took a very taxing toll on his health. He stated that because of his sexuality, he felt immense shame. And when David started to think that this wasn't working, he, like many others, tried to play the role-playing card, saying that he and the decoy were just fulfilling a fantasy. 
Without diving into all the legal jargon, David was ultimately found guilty in September of 2006. The court stated that the pictures and sexual advances made by David were attempts to persuade slash influence a minor to engage in explicit activities with him. Because David lied under oath, he got six and a half years in prison and 10 years of supervised release. And as you can imagine, this result took a toll on his career. David was not allowed to be around anyone under the age of 18 unless they were accompanied by an adult. David really struggled to find work after he was released in 2012, being rejected by two other congregations located in Maryland. In 2013, David was arrested once more for not registering as a sex offender, using the internet without approval, and looking at explicit adult images. Then in 2018, he was arrested for a third time for continuously violating his probation terms. Specifically, he was buying unauthorized devices in order to get on the internet and solicit sex on sites such as Craigslist. And I believe it was in 2021 when David was classified as a tier 3 offender, which is the highest risk. Richard Brolt, aka The Crying Predator, is most well known for, well, his crying meltdown. He was a full-time student and 19 years old when he began talking to a 13-year-old decoy on the internet, and only minutes into the conversation, he began to ask questions like, what is your bra size, are you a virgin, and what are your favorite positions? As the conversation went along, Richard admitted to being obsessed with the idea of being with a virgin, and eagerly asked about when they could meet. At the Sting House, when Chris Hansen sat Richard down, he instantly knew that he was in trouble, even saying that he had a bad feeling about the situation leading up to his arrival, and that in hindsight, he shouldn't have done anything. Richard then began rambling about how his life is now ruined, and that he has a really bad addiction to the internet. And at one point, he even said he was going to take his own life with a gun once the episode goes live. <laughs> Did you, any, did you have any second thoughts about coming over and doing it? If you read the message, I always said I was iffy and I didn't really think about doing I didn't really want to do it. I can't get that thought out of my head. What thought? Doing something with a girl your age. Look at the last... Look, see? I was thinking about the whole time. I didn't think it was right and I don't know why the f I came over here. But you're here, Richard. Yes, I know. I'm sorry, sir. You talk to kids like this on the internet all the time? To tell you the truth, I swear to God, this is the first time I ever did this. I can always you talk to older women. Can, can you can you deep throw? When Richard was told to leave, he actually refused and continued to cry, and I couldn't hear it in the version that I found, but apparently he was also farting throughout the entire segment. Richard seeked out legal help to fight the case, but after three years, he ultimately pleaded guilty to three felony charges. Sometime later, Richard did get married and decided to move to North Carolina. In 2023, Chris Hansen tried to reach out to Richard to interview him on his podcast. He was able to find a number that was associated with Richard, but when he called, it was a somewhat feminine voice that picked up. Some people believe that this was Richard's wife or possibly a new girlfriend, but there are also some that say the voice sounds more like Richard doing an impression. When Chris stated the reason for the call, the voice on the other end said, uh, you accused someone who was 19 years old. You're an effing dick. Don't call this number ever again. For Sex I Am Not Coming refers to a 34-year-old man named Apulash who was a software development director that came across a decoy posing as a 13-year-old girl. When he started the conversation with the decoy, he asked if they would be willing to take him in the mouth. He then said that he could be in a lot of trouble because having sex with a minor is classified as rape. Apulash then took a day off from work to meet up at the decoy's house, and when Chris Hansen came out to question Apulash, he said that he was only there to hang out. Aside from this lie, he was actually pretty honest right from the start. He didn't bother lying about his own age or knowing the age of the decoy. But then he goes and says, for sex, I am not coming. We also learned that Apulash is actually married, and according to him, his marriage isn't going very well. So in his despair, he looked for comfort in this 13-year-old. He also adds that he would never rape a child because he is educated and has an MBA. What's going on? Nothing much. I thought I'll just make a friend and that's it. Told just to make a friend? Yeah. And how old is he? She said she was 13. 13? Yeah. And how old are you? 34. 34. Yeah. 
And why did you think it was okay at the age of 34 to come visit a 13-year-old girl home alone? I said, I mean, it is for sex, I am not coming. For sex, you are not coming? Yeah. So I'll just make a good friend. Um, so I'm educated. I have an MBA. You have an MBA? Yeah. You know, I'm married, and, you know, the marriage is not going well, so... I'm sorry, you're married? Yeah, yes, I am. And, and the marriage is not going well? Yeah, so I... Yeah, just one different to talk to, kind of. Most of you will probably assume that this entire event proceeded normally with Abhilash going to jail, but Abhilash actually fled the US. So I couldn't find any recent updates, but as far as I know, he is still wanted by the Harris County Sheriff's Department on a charge of unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. Vincent Ambrosio was born on March 25th, 1996 in Wappinger Falls, New York, and developed bipolar depression. In Vincent's episode, he was 19 years old and he met a 12-year-old girl named Jenna Claire online who he wanted to meet up with. Vincent agreed to make a 65-mile road trip to a sting house that was located in Fairfield, Connecticut, believing that he would get to have sex with a minor. Upon entering the house, Vincent mentioned how the decoy looked different from the pictures before leaning in for a hug, which was rejected. The two had a brief conversation before the decoy left to set up the TV, which was the cue for Chris to come in. Immediately, Vincent understood the situation and said, I knew this was going to happen. Somebody was going to show up here. Vincent then started to break down, saying that he has nothing to live for anyway and that his whole life's a mess. We learned from him that he failed high school and doesn't have a job, nor any motivation to do anything. However, he did ironically mention that he wanted to become a cop briefly, but due to his weight, he never pursued that path. And Chris showed some sympathy for the guy on several occasions. For example, when Vincent said that he had no friends because he dresses weird, Chris said that he doesn't think anything about him is particularly weird besides the fact that he tried to hook up with a minor. And when Vincent mentioned his weight, Chris talked about several of his family members who also struggled with their size. What's going on? How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Doing? Doing? What was gonna happen? You knew what was gonna happen. Somebody was gonna show up here. Somebody, Somebody was gonna, gonna show up here. It's alright. You know what? I have nothing to live for anyway. Well, what do you mean? Yeah? <laughs> Life's a mess. Why is it a mess? <sighs> I failed high school. I, I have no motivation to finish it. <sighs> None of the pills about work. <sighs> what do you do for a living? I don't have a job. <sighs> I'm a fuck up. <sighs> I want to be a cop. I wasn't going to do anything. I just. You want to be a cop? I want to have a friend. Well, then why don't you go join the police academy or... I'm fat. I can't do anything. What grade are you in? Seven. Let's cool. See. Could I see a pic of you? You like older guys. You said all this. Vincent was told to grab his jacket and leave, and he was arrested in the garage. During his police interview, Vincent admitted to everything, but eventually attempted to redirect the blame off of himself and over to the decoy. On one occasion, he cited a lie that he made up about his grandpa being sick and hospitalized to try and get the persistent decoy to back off. We also find out that Vincent created a fake online persona called Hannah. Vincent used this fake persona to try and gain the decoy's trust by introducing Hannah to the decoy, saying that he wanted to have a three-way with both her and Hannah. Towards the end of the questioning, Vincent also admitted to talking to a 14-year-old on a different occasion, but was adamant that the conversation was never explicit. Vincent faced three charges, and he actually avoided telling his parents about his arrest. When Vincent's dad did find out, he was shocked and he posed as a police officer to try and contact the decoy. His dad was under the impression that this decoy was actually generated by a computer and wasn't real. Vincent was arrested for a second time in 2016 when police discovered CP on two of Vincent's phones. And from what I understand, Vincent is now living nearby Fairfield, Connecticut in a halfway home, which is an institute for people with criminal backgrounds to gradually reintegrate into society. This entry refers to a man named Michael Lubrano who was 25 years old when he began talking to a decoy that he thought was 14. Lubrano was also known for his online alias, Ice Truck Killer 103. 
Many remember Lubrano for his pretty excessive self-deprecation when speaking with Chris. Lubrano worked in waste management when he met the decoy and upon learning about her age, he said the following, we can get high and watch Family Guy, then see where that takes us. Lubrano brought along some marijuana to share with the decoy, but <laughs> it was basically just a stem. He was offered brownies, which I want you to keep in the back of your mind for now, and the decoy said she was going to get a drink and then asked Lubrano if he wanted anything. When he heard this question, he sort of did a double take and looked a bit shocked. He tried to follow the decoy into another room before he was blocked off by Chris. At the sight of him, Lubrano asked, are you Chris Hansen? He also said he sort of wanted this situation to happen to him because his life has been terrible up to that point. And regarding those brownies from earlier, Lubrano said when he saw them, he knew something was wrong. Lubrano had been really frustrated with himself and saw this opportunity as a chance to finally get a woman, or in this case, a young girl. Want to come down, you know, come talk down. to her. Talk to her. You're Chris Hansen? I am. Have you seen the show? <laughs> you have seen it. I thought you were real funny on Opie and Anthony. Oh, you, you listened to me on Opie and Anthony. <laughs> Can I honestly tell you something? Yeah, I, I almost think in the back of my mind that I almost wanted this to happen. Really? I, my life just got <laughs> lately. I'm in the waste management business. I'm a dispatcher for roll-off guys. And is, it, is it a pretty good job? <laughs> it was. What's so funny about the brownies? Right when I saw the brownies, I knew. You knew what? I, I knew I was going to be running into you. I think this is the first time I'm, we've had brownies. I'm kind of chuckling about it just because, you know, I shouldn't have. So you think it's funny? No, I don't think it's funny. I, I mean, it, it's funny how dumb I, I'm really turning into. I don't know, because I can't get a girl. Why can't you get a girl? I mean, there's got to be girls your age out there. Yeah, there's girls my age, but I have no self-confidence, so... Now, you seem nervous about coming over, saying you're going to have to sneak in. What were you so nervous about? <laughs> Running into you, but I guess it doesn't... Uh -huh. Well, know, that, that doesn't seem that seem like it was much of a deterrent tonight, now, was it? How many times have you seen the show? I'm a religious watcher. I think. A religious watcher? Well, I watch it whenever I can. Sometimes I go and, you know, hunt out clips on the internet. So you watch it on the internet, too? I watch it anyway I can. Since Lubrano was an avid watcher and listener of the show, the conversation went by fast and he didn't deny anything. In court, Lubrano pleaded guilty to endangering the welfare of a child and was sentenced to lifetime parole. While in court, he also mentioned that he had plans to take the girl to a strip club as well as his plans to have hardcore sex with her. Maurice J. Woolen was a former cancer research doctor and UCLA graduate who was born on February 28, 1958. Woolen, aka Crazy underscore Frazy 2005, drove about an hour to visit a decoy who he suspected to be a 14-year-old girl named Willow. Woolen made an effort to attract the girl by showing off his wealth and mentioning all of the explicit things that he'd do to her. And just to make things even more interesting, during this time, he was actually talking to another decoy who he was trying to keep a secret from Willow. On arrival, Woolen followed the decoy into the backyard and he poured himself a drink. But because it had been sitting in the pitcher outside for so long, when Woolen went to pour a bit into his glass, the entire thing spilled all over him. The decoy told Woolen to just wait outside while she went to change into a bathing suit, but he decided to follow the decoy inside for a towel and when he crossed over this little like wall, he noticed a cameraman in the corner of his eye. Immediately, Woolen left, saying, I gotta take off. However, he didn't get far as cops stopped him in the driveway and arrested him. Obviously, at this point, Woolen knew he was in big trouble, so he took off his sunglasses and threw them onto the floor out of rage. While getting handcuffed, he frantically repeated, I wasn't going to do anything over and over. He broke into tears and seemed to just have mentally snapped. Tub. Pour me a drink. I'm actually gonna put on my suit. Maybe we can get in the hot tub because it's all warm. Oh, jeez. So where are you coming from? San Francisco. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, so there probably was a lot of traffic, do you have huh? A, do you have a towel? As the doctor looks for a towel, he spots Dateline's camera crew. I gotta take off. Sir? 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 Yeah. I need to talk to you for a minute. Yes. Yeah. 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 Get up the ground! Get up the ground! Get on 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 the ground! 
Oh man, I wasn't doing anything. Get his keys. I wasn't doing anything. At first, he refused to answer any questions from the police, but eventually he cried out that he never did anything wrong in the past and believes that he shouldn't have been arrested because of that. When given his phone call, he contacted his wife and demanded her to bring $30,000 to cover his bail and made it clear that she couldn't tell the kids. What ensued was a two-year-long legal battle. Wolin and his lawyer did agree to a no-contest plea, which gave him two months of house arrest and three years of probation. And just a fun fact, this lawyer was named Blair Burke, who actually represented celebrities such as Leonardo DiCaprio and Mel Gibson, just to name a couple. Probably the worst thing to come of this was that his reputation got absolutely destroyed. Since he tried to get out of the incident with no repercussions, the case prolonged and caught the eye of several news outlets near his residence. Needless to say, he got backlash within his local community. Wolin's license to practice medicine was permanently revoked after he was convicted. But nevertheless, he was able to find consultant jobs in Washington, California, and even in Singapore. In January of 2021, an Instagram post from a woman who was apparently Wolin's daughter daughter had caught people's eyes. The post asked for help regarding her missing father and shortly after going live, the entire account went private, likely due to all of the messages coming in from TCAP viewers. In August of the same year, a YouTube channel by the name of The Skip Tracer uploaded a video containing an official report from a coroner that stated Woolen had taken his own life. And at first, most would probably assume that this was due to all the negativity that he received as a result of being on the show, but according to some of his family and friends, it was more so an issue with alcohol. So, me, my mommy, and my daddy refers to one of the decoys that appeared rather than the suspect. The decoy's lackluster acting and his appearance just solidified the goofiness of this entire interaction in many viewers' minds. Of course, I'll show you guys some clips in just a bit and you'll totally understand why. And as far as I know, his identity is pretty well hidden. Most people just refer to him as the male HVP decoy instead of an actual name. But anyways, this decoy was matched up with a man named Jesse Velez who thought the decoy was a 13 year old boy. Upon meeting the decoy, Jesse says, you don't look 13, and then later he asks for some form of ID. You hungry? Yeah. Where do you wanna go? Doesn't matter to me. I'm not really hungry, I just ate. No? No. So you wanna stay here? No, not really. You don't wanna stay here? What do you want to do after? Hang out? No. Netflix? Chill? No. Netflix yeah, chill? Yeah, I was, I was watching Netflix when, you, when I was like, you know. Okay, what, what show? Uh, I watched like TV shows like um, House of Cards, stuff like that. Oh, I haven't seen that. Is it pretty good? Yeah, it's, it's pretty good. good. Yeah, we can, we can Netflix and chill. That's gonna be a weird question, but you have your ID on you? I don't have my ID on me. No. Sorry, I'm Does only 13. My mom keeps having her purse. Who lives here? Who lives here? Oh, well, I live here. Me, my mommy, and my daddy. So as you saw, the entire thing was just really awkward. And once Jesse asked about who else lives in the house, that's when we get our famous line. After the show, the decoy found work with the New England Patriots as a security officer and later worked with the Kraft Group, which was a company responsible for event management that was also created by the owner of the Patriots. The guy also occasionally worked with the Warwick Police Department and the Massachusetts State Police around 2019 to 2020. Jerry Wayne Martin Kosis, aka I'm Kosis, aka Creepy Predator, was born on May 2nd, 1975. And he's primarily remembered for his jarring appearance and the strange way that he speaks. Jerry was 30 years old when he met a decoy pretending to be a 13 year old girl named Chloe. And the conversation the two had seemed to be relatively tame compared to what we typically see on this show. That was until the decoy started to push a bit and we then spiral into degeneracy. The decoy mentioned that she wanted to piss on Jerry and he said he didn't care. And I don't want to get too graphic, but this escalated to the point where Jerry was inquiring about getting shat on. When Jerry arrived at the sting house, he followed the sound of a girl's voice and says, I had a nice little walk today. But before he could get very far, Chris comes out and asks, where did you walk from? And that's when we get our quote, oh, way, way, way. Hey, what? Say, I had a nice little walk today. Yeah, where did you have to walk from? Oh, way, way, way. Way, way. Why don't you come on over here and have a seat on the stool for me, please? Sure. Where did you walk from today? Oh, from, uh, 
Please sit down. Uh... When questioned as to what he had planned, Jerry said he was just trying to make some friends and at the very most, he just wants to be a good mentor, almost like a brother. And that was pretty much the extent of this encounter. Jerry did ask if he could remain anonymous, but obviously that was never going to happen. He was promptly arrested after the conversation. However, despite admitting to everything that he did, he did try to fight his charges, which resulted in a legal battle that lasted nearly four years. In the end, Jerry pleaded guilty. He got 240 days in jail and three years of probation. Sometime in 2022, Chris Hansen stated that Jerry moved in with his parents at some point after he got out of jail and was pretty active on Facebook. He made posts talking about his passion for the public transport systems, primarily trains, but it seems that he has stopped posting around 2019. Okay, so this guy is probably the most famous person to ever come out of TCAP, the pizza guy. Jeff Sokol was born on June 4th, 1971, and was actually divorced for 10 years prior to popping up on the show. Jeff was a massive sports fan, and apparently his lifelong goal was to find a career as a manager within some sort of sports league. But instead of working in the sports industry, he was stuck being an insurance auditor. Jeff said that his divorce along with his career caused him to fall into a deep depression. Enter the 14 year old. Jeff asked the girl about various sexual topics and even tried to conjure up a fake marriage contract in an attempt to fool her into believing that it was legal for him to have sex with her. Furthermore, the guy tried to find ways to satiate his ego by correlating his dick size to his value as a man. At one point, he said that male ballet dancers probably don't have penises, so they're not men. But he later revealed to the decoy that he actually had a small dick and that he suspected himself of projecting. Jeff drove two and a half hours to Fairfield from Boston and planned on staying the night with the girl since her mother was out of town. Jeff arrived at the house with his famous pizza, some vodka, and an ocean spray orange juice container. And I probably don't need to tell you how awkward this conversation was. During his interrogation, he continued to insist that he never planned on any sort of sexual activity with the girl. He just wanted to hang out with her since she seemed mature. When questioned about that fake marriage thing, Jeff said it was just a joke. The interrogator also intentionally said that the girl was 12 years old, which Jeff enthusiastically corrected, saying that she was actually 14 and that there wasn't much of a difference between the two ages anyway. He also added that he was willing to wait until she was 16 before doing anything. The police interrogator was so disgusted that he ended up stepping away. But before he could leave, Jeff asked why they couldn't allow him to actually do anything first before stepping in and then arresting him. When the interrogation continued, Jeff said that he blamed society for his position because society painted a narrative that all men were pigs who only wanted sex and that he was nothing like that. He also tried to justify his actions by saying sex is a part of life and should never be looked at in a negative light. In court, Jeff stated that his friends and family were in support of him and he was trying to sell this image that he was a generous and kind person, saying that he frequently volunteered at places like the fire stations, shelters, and aquariums. And in an odd attempt to quote-unquote lighten the mood, he added that he really liked playing tennis and practicing martial arts. Jeff's attorney was equally as strange, and he actually went through two other lawyers who dropped him for unknown reasons. But anyways, this third attorney said that the age of consent used to be 9 to 13 in some sort of attempt to justify Jeff's actions. And then this next part is pretty funny. This guy just aired out his client in court. The lawyer said that Jeff should get off light because he had a minimal risk of reoffending due to his penile plethysmography showing that he had little to no desire for sex. And then the lawyer just added at the end, oh, and he's not attracted to kids. <laughs> so as you could expect, Jeff lost. In 2017, he was sentenced to seven years in prison and 10 years of probation. Additionally, he got two extra two and a half year sentences, so five years in total, which he was to serve concurrently. In 2018, Jeff attempted to change his name, but he was denied. And in that same year, he was also denied parole. When he was released from prison, he seemed to live pretty quietly. He sold his apartment and decided to move back with his parents, who are said to be very rich. Dustin McFedridge, aka DMAC, was born on November 15th, 1980. He was 26 years old when he appeared on TCAP and suffered from cerebral palsy. 
Dustin met a 13 year old named Laura and after talking to her for less than a week and learning that she was a virgin, he offered to take her virginity. And for some odd reason, Dustin repeatedly asked Decoy for her social security number. And to make matters even worse, he actually said he wanted to have a threesome when the decoy said that she had an 8 year old sister. Dustin traveled nearly 6 hours from Tennessee to Kentucky to visit Laura. He brought along a razor since he also said that he wanted to shave her. And when the decoy first laid eyes on Dustin in person, she actually felt a bit sorry for him seeing him struggle to get out of his car. But she quickly remembered all the disgusting things he said online and just moved on. Right after Chris confronts Dustin, Dustin starts defending himself saying that he had no ill intentions and lied about not bringing any other items with him. We also find out that this is not Dustin's first time talking to a minor. On another occasion, Dustin got in touch with a 14 year old whose mother's boyfriend was a cop. When the boyfriend found out about this 26 year old trying to get sex from a minor, he threatened to press charges. But in the end, that family just let Dustin go after he apologized over the phone. I, I brought a razor. A razor. And what were you going to do with the razor? I thought she wanted to be shaved down there. And I thought she said she was 17 or something. Well, I've got the transcript right here. I, I believe that, sir. Right. He was told online she was 13 and even referred to her young age several times, wishing she was five years older. And as for all the explicit I sex talk. I was trying to see if I could find out if that was a cop or so I didn't waste the, well, it sounds, like, it, it sounds like what you're trying to see is if you could score with a 13-year-old girl. After Chris laid out every single detail of everything that Dustin did wrong, he was still insisting that he wasn't solely to blame for this. In his mind, the decoy was also at fault here since she led him on. During the police interrogation, Dustin continued to blame the decoy and said that he wished Chris didn't lie to him about not getting arrested. The officer also asked about that previous interaction he had with the minor, and Dustin said that initially that conversation was with a woman in her 30s to 40s, but she just out of the blue asked Dustin to talk to her daughter instead of her. Supposedly, the mother approved of Dustin dating her 14 year old. We also find out that when Dustin was at a Japanese steakhouse to celebrate his birthday, that mother and daughter confronted Dustin saying that a cop was going to be waiting for him the next day after school. So now it just seems more like Dustin was harassing the family. Dustin's mother was tasked to de-escalate the situation and was able to resolve the argument. During the questioning, he also admitted to owning CP. In October of 2007, police searched Dustin's residence and uncovered several CDs which had hundreds of CP photos burned onto them. His bail was set to $50,000 and he was sentenced to 5 years in federal prison. About 2 years into his sentence, he got another 8 year prison term after being convicted on another account of sexual exploitation. This 8 year sentence was to be served concurrently with his 5 year one and by this point his health was really declining and he was bound to a wheelchair. In 2020, Dustin was required to revisit court for violating probation and after failing several polygraph tests on whether or not he had been alone with any juveniles, he faced another their three-year sentence. In 2022, Dustin was caught talking to a group of teenage girls in a video game store which violated his probation. Yet again, he was called into court. He also wrote a letter saying, if I could access a gun, I'd end my suffering and kill myself. The judge seemed to have pity on Dustin and did not send him back to prison, but placed him under court-supervised parole for the remainder of his life. Chris Hansen tried to get into contact with Dustin about a year or two ago, but when Dustin heard Chris's voice, he angrily shouted, don't call me, before hanging up. When Chris tried to call again, Dustin said, no thank you, do not call me again or it will be harassment. So that's going to end part two of the TCAP iceberg. Thank you so much for making it all the way to the end. It truly means a lot to me when you spend your time watching my videos. Again, if you haven't watched the first part yet, visit the description and give it a watch. And just like with part one, this part is also going to get demonetized. So I want to give a special thank you to all of my wonderful channel members for supporting me. Thank you so much to Melody, Fartbag69, Hero, Devoured Eagle, Fear the Milkman, Sasha Wise, Jerome Reuter, Minus Five Stars, and zero to nine. If any of you guys are interested in supporting the channel by becoming a member, you can visit the link in the description. It also gives you early access to my videos and no mid rolls. So with all of that being said, stay safe and I hope you all have an amazing day.